Hello! It is a rainy day and I'm feeling kind of sleepy, but I really want to play more Talos 2, so let's get started. I have some ideas that I've been thinking about. I wrote down in a document some stuff I wanted to talk about once the, the game loads in here. Because uh, I've slept multiple times since the last episode, and I've seen a little bit more of the game from other people's perspectives. And uh, yeah, let's, let's just sit here for a moment. And I'm going to read through these notes that I took. So, one of the main things I noticed is about some of the themes of this game. It's interesting to me that the game seems to be posing the idea that humanity is good and trying to argue against misanthropy, but I think it can be both good and bad, and I also think it doesn't need to be exactly reproduced. These robots can go on to be something else entirely from humanity, and I don't think that would be sad or bad, it would just be a different balance of good and bad. I think it already is that way, even if they don't want to admit it. Now, a lot of the media intended for us in the real world is about humanity, since most of us are bound by our human origins, and we can't change that. So I guess it makes sense the writer for this game would take this angle. But then again, they emphasize it so much that maybe the point is for the player to notice a dissonance. Or maybe another mis- sorry, another interpretation is... They're asking us to consider what really makes us human, since that was the whole point of the first game. Except the word they used was person, not human, I think. It's just kind of jarring how it seems to also be holding the back, which is maybe also the point for us to notice. Also, they went through a lot of effort to make their faces emote like humans and such, and I really wonder how much of the game we're supposed to take seriously. Like, are we really supposed to accept that the process created sapient beings capable of forming a society rather than an AI that is just good at solving puzzles? I suppose we are, but then what else is meant to be taken seriously, and what's meant to appear suspicious to us? And another interesting thing is that at the start of the game, uh, Elohim told us that we have to be human. Well, also the, the first game they pointed out to us is the whole point was learning to defy Elohim. There, there's a lot of conflicting and interesting ideas going on in this game, and I'm not sure what to make of it all yet. And uh, I also have a note here that apparently I forgot a star in the first area, so we will go do that eventually. And, uh, let's see, another note is that my thoughts on the mega structure, you know, it's a machine with puzzles in it, and the universe is also a machine, you know, with, uh, where they built puzzles out in the world here that we've been going through the outside puzzles. So it's kind of like a metaphor for, you know, the, the mega structure being a machine with puzzles in it, and then the, the world outside of it also being a puzzle with machines in it, sorry, machine with puzzles in it. Because Athena was talking about the universe being a cold, dark machine without sapient life. I really like that, that one scene with Athena talking about that. It really resonates with me. And, uh, you could also think of the megastructure as an equivalent from the Tower of Talos 1. And about these- about these text adventures... This is something that really, really makes me question some things, because, uh... In the text adventure, who is picking- picking the options? Is it us, 1K? Or is the game designer of the text adventure picking the options? And- cause, like, it, it uses the same interface for us as the player, you know, we, we see the dialogue, dialogue options the same way. You know, in Talos 1, there was that one part where the uh, the serpent tried to capture us in an infinite loop with the dialogue, and we had to, like, break out of it, and, and like, the keyboard typed without our hands moving or something weird happening. It, it was very, very strange. I just have all sorts of questions about the lore of this game, given that the dialogue system is identical for these text adventures that seem to be on rails, versus, uh, you know, the the actual interactions with other robots here, other characters, other people, which are supposedly not on rails, you know? Cause like... It, it makes you wonder... Did they really program all the different things you could say in, and 1K is just thinking of a few things that happen to work for the game, or is it also suggesting stuff? I, I don't- I don't know how it works, and it makes me question things. We'll get- we'll get back to this in a moment, I have one more thought. They have drones, right? Because I thought that uh, Yakut sent a drone over to one of the other puzzle sets and saw that it was all dark. So they have drones, they know how to remotely control stuff. Why are they so afraid of alternative energy sources and all that? Why are they still rattled by the explosion that blew up a town? They could just have the energy source be quite a distance away from the town, and they could manage it remotely with drones, and then if it blows up, nothing bad happens to them. Like, it, it, there's really a lot of unusual conflict in this game, and it's not clear how much of that is just because this is a game and they're, they're the writers are not perfect, or if it's actually something that we're supposed to notice, and 
I don't know. I just have a lot of questions about these things that I've been thinking about. Alright. Let me... Let me minimize this document, because we are done with it. And, uh... Uh, what was the first area of this one? Yes, here we go. One out of two stars. I don't know how I never noticed that. I think I clicked on it in one of the episodes and, uh, just didn't notice. But yeah, we, we've got to go back here and get that. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Alright, so we did this one, right? Yeah, Ghost of Atlantis. That was last episode. We also have... Jefferson Goldblum. And we have... Argument Simulator. You know what, this one's probably gonna make me annoyed, so let's do this one first, and I have a feeling that was gonna be more comedic. So then, you know, after I get annoyed, we can read some comedy to calm down. That's like a good plan. Welcome to Argument Simulator. Start, credits, quit. Uh, let's check the credits. Written and designed by Guta. <laughs> I'm not really sure you need a whole separate credit screen for that. Choose your character. See, this is- this is the thing. Who- who's picking these choices? They're not showing up on the screen here. This, this is outside of this computer screen that we're interacting with here. So is this us? How do we know what choices? How does 1K know what choices to pick? It- this- this- how does this work? <laughs> uh... I'm gonna- I'm more of an assistant kind of person. Let's pick a library assistant as us. Choose your argument. Excuse me? It's <laughs> true, it's false, it's not true. <laughs> um... Let's go with it's true. <laughs> okay, maybe this is not going to annoy me after all. What? What is going on here? <laughs> so you, basically, you have to keep continuing the argument, or you get a game over. Okay, yeah, that's, uh... <laughs> that's actually... that's actually a really apt metaphor. Ah... <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, uh... Okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's do Jefferson Goldblum and the Spectre of Modernity. Oh yeah, I've been trying to add uh, chapters to the videos. It's not as easy a task as I assumed it would be, because uh, I wanted to put emojis in the chapters, but YouTube is weird about that. Like, it, it, the emojis at the start or end of the chapter name get cut out for some reason, so you have to have text before and after the emoji. So that's why some of the chapter names are kind of weird or don't really read properly, it's because I want the emojis to be there so that they stand out, so you can, you know, see what puzzle number is going on and all that. But, uh, yeah. Also, the chapters have to be at least 30 seconds, so there's a little bit of weirdness with that as well. Jefferson Goldblum. Jefferson Goldblum and the Spectre of Modernity, a true story. Yep, dedicated to Mac. Alright. You, a Jefferson Goldblum, directly step- sorry, deftly step out of your charging pod and walk into the main lobby of the Goldblum Institute. Jefferson Goldblum has a charging pod? Excuse me? <laughs> it is a humble abode, filled with a small four-seater sofa, a table, a coffee bar, and an ar arboretum. Ginny HD, your financee and a leading member of the Casorati. Oh my gosh, I I'm not even going to try to pronounce that jazz ensemble's name. Greet you from the sofa while Frankie Soy Sauce waves from the coffee bar. The Velociraptor John Malcolm drives out of the Arboretum with his motorcycle wearing his green armored t-shirt. Uh, it's, it's funny because you can't tell what's them being silly on purpose versus what's them misunderstanding old human culture. <laughs> You're just left wondering, is this a joke or being silly or is this a misunderstanding? So it's gonna all gonna be combination of the both. Well, Genie HD, if I remember from Road to Gehenna, was our uh, partner in crime or whatever. Partner in opposite of crime. Partner in uh, doing good deeds. I'm not sure what to say exactly. <laughs> oh, Jefferson, cries Genie. Good morning. Good morning, Genie HD. You reply. Did you sleep well, my darling? 
Oh, Jefferson, I slept most dreadfully. Why is that? Is your charging pot too hard? No, Jefferson, that's not it at all, JNHT mourns. My charging pot is very comfortable. I don't know why I slept so poorly, but I woke up on this small, four-year sofa, which is strange because I went to sleep in my room. You think about this carefully while stroking your guitar. JNHT has no problem recharging most nights. You are about to reply when a klaxon resounds throughout the Goldblum Institute. Klaxon, that's a... that's a car horn, right? I don't remember exactly. But yeah, the, this whole thing about charging pods, I don't think charging pods were mentioned in Road to Gehenna. Maybe they were? Like, I, I know that there was stuff about the, the very first interactive media you played in Road to Gehenna with the, the electric sheep and all that, but I think in the other stories there was no mention of charging pods. Shut the klaxon off. You walk over to the computer terminal and attempt to shut down the klaxon, but the machine refuses to accept your command without the correct password. John Malcolm revs up his motorcycle, a sure sign that he is deeply worried. Jefferson, you have to do something about this noise, he calls. <laughs> 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 Our options are to shoot the klaxon, play your guitar, or guess the password. Well, I mean... Let's try that, because it won't take very long, right? You try to guess the password using the unbreakable cipher 654321 password uh, passed down by your ancestors. But the central computer system tells you that the password must contain at least one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, a symbol, a number, and a hieroglyph. Uh, are you sure you're not trying to set the password rather than enter an existing password? Because, uh... That's, that's not how it's supposed to go down. Oh, drat! Frankie Soy Sauce Streaks. Jefferson, what will you do now? Play your guitar, and then we have four guess- Three- sorry, three guess again options. They all say guess again, it's just the same option three times. Master Sushin. You unsling your guitar from your back and check the strings to make sure that they are in the proper order. How would they not be in the proper order? <laughs> Do they not know how guitar strings work? Then you take a heroic stance with your chest puffed out, your legs splayed wide, and your guitar held heroically aloft. You play a chord, a perfect chord, followed by another equally perfect chord, and another, and another. As always, all the chords that you play are perfect. This is your greatest burden. Mollified, the klaxon shuts itself off. See, I knew that, like, in the uh, Jefferson Goldblum series in Road to Gehenna, uh, Jefferson Goldblum's guitar music playing had, like, magical powers or something and created other dimensions, so I had a feeling that would work in some sort of semblance way. Talk to your team. You turn from the now silenced central computer console and look at your team, who are all gazing back at you with varying levels of wonderment in their eyes. Ask why the klaxon was blaring. John Malcolm dismounts his motorcycle with an air of certainty and queries the central computer console with sure taps of his reptilian claws upon the keyboard. Wait, he's a reptile? Excuse me? <laughs> did I- did I miss- something up there that I forget what I read aloud. I, I, I have a habit of doing that sometimes where I just, I get so focused on actually reading aloud and focusing on making sure I'm reading properly and speaking clearly that I kind of don't even pay attention to what I'm actually reading. <laughs> I've done that a few times this playthrough. It seems, John Malcolm says, that the sensors have detected a threat of galactic magnitude. Oh no, cries Genie HD, while Frankie Soy Sauce drops his cup of joe in fear. Oh, that's don't, don't splash it. I hope it's not hot. Ask what the threat is or check John's findings. Aw, uh, I think we're... These are our friends, right? Let's trust them. Ask what the threat is. A shudder goes through John Malcolm's magnificent plumage. Something far more dangerous than anything we've encountered so far, Jefferson, he proclaims. Oh, John Malcolm, what is it? exclaimed GNHD. What could it possibly be? We have already defeated the dastardly Dr. Elion. What could be more dangerous than him? This time, my friends, John Malcolm says after a pause of precisely 2.5 seconds, <laughs> we will be up against the specter of modernity. So, we have a full name used in dialogue here. 
<laughs> I'm. That's another thing where I don't know if they're being silly or if they don't know about people generally only using one name or the other in speech. Like this is this is absolutely a situation where you would either say John, like if you're on good terms with that person, or Malcolm, depending on you know uh, culture and level of respect and all that. Ah, uh, things that you have to learn <laughs> with autism. Ask what the specter is. Ask when the specter will arrive, or take action. She probably know when it'll arrive first, because then we'll know how much time we have to figure out a game plan and ask what it is afterwards. The specter of modernity travels at the speed of time itself, says John Malcolm gravely. It has already arrived, Jefferson. We just haven't encountered it yet. Oh dear. <laughs> Frankie soy sauce turns from the coffee maker. A fresh cup of battery acid clutched carefully in his human fingers. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I mean, it's called a coffee maker, but uh, what? I like this is, and then it says human fingers. Like this, how much of this is intended to be silly versus? How much of this is a misunderstanding on the author's part about how old ancient humans worked? <laughs> I know I keep asking that like a broken record, but like... I mean that like almost every other paragraph makes you ask that, really. We must do something, Jefferson. I do not care for umami, but if the specter takes away my ability to taste coffee, I do not know whatever I will do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, umami is one of those w taste words that most people barely even think about or use or say in general. So, uh, it seems very carefully chosen because it's like the least common taste word that people would ever use. Then again, I mean, there, there are... I suppose it would be good in like a, a comedy TV show or something, but it would be similarly absurd there. I reassure him. That's our only option. All tastes are precious to us, Frank. <laughs> That's not the kind of reassurance. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought we were going to reassure about the threat, not about the taste. <laughs> all tastes are precious to us, Frankie, you say. Sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and yes, also umami. We shan't surrender any of them, for they are what renders us human. Uh, not so sure about that. Ask what the specter is. Ask when the specter will arrive. Well, we already did that, right? So I guess we just looped back to one of these uh, loot points. Ask what it is. What is the specter of modernity, you ask, while turning, tuning your guitar for the coming battle? I'm glad that you asked, interest on Malcolm. As you all well know, for I have told this tale many times, my people have feared for many millennia that this day would come. John Malcolm smooths the feathers along his long neck with his claws. <laughs> right, feathered uh, reptile. So I guess they're like a right because there's a dinosaur. Right, right, John Malcolm. Okay, I'm. i This is probably continuing. Something I forgot from Road to Gehenna, because there, there was a dinosaur dimension that they went into. So I'm guessing John Malcolm is one of the dinosaurs that they brought back from that dimension or whatever. Something like that. I guess I forgot about that. Time to continue. The Spectre, as you all also know, will bring an end to the old and ring in a new era of unparalleled technological advancements until there is no space left in the world for such cherished human and dinosaurian qualities like love, creativity, the ability to taste umami, loyalty, and friendship. The circle of renewal will end, it will only move forward at an ever-accelerating pace until we reach the limits of existence itself. Okay, so I'm guessing I was supposed to take this branch first, because this is where Imami gets mentioned originally, and because the person speaking is a, uh, dinosaur, as this word here says, then maybe in their culture it's more common to say umami as, you know, a uh, more common taste to say in common speech. And so that would lead to the other person in the other branch that we read earlier talking about umami. I guess that makes more sense now. <laughs> Alright. 
How do we take action? Friends, humans, dinosaurians, countrymen. Possessed by a sudden urge to act, you jump up on the coffee maker, much to Frankie Soisos' dismay. We cannot let this threat to our very way of life go unanswered. No! We must stand against the specter and not yield until we are victorious. Will you stand with me? Wait, what? Bring an end to the old and ring in a new era of unparalleled technological advancement. Okay, so this is... I guess this is a story of man versus technology or something like that. Uh, yeah, I guess there's no room for nuance when you're an action hero. Wait for the response. Yes, my darling, anything for a human world, cries Jenny HD. Friend, you know that I will stand by you until the bitter end, as John Malcolm solemnly. For coffee, shouts Frankie Soy Sauce, and for love. But, Jenny HD, sorry, but, comma, asks Jenny HD after the shouting and swearing of fealty is done. How will we prevail? The specter of modernity is too powerful for you to fight it on your own. Of course she is right, as she usually is. Oh, we get to choose who to take with us or to go alone. Take Jenny HD with you, take Frankie Soy Sauce with you, take John Malcolm with you, or go alone. Well, John Malcolm is the one who seems to know about all this, so... Ah, oh, Jefferson, I am honored that you would choose me as your companion on this quest, John Malcolm says, flapping his flightless, sparsely feathered arms in gratitude. Together we will defeat the Spectre of Modernity, and our adventures will live on in song for generations to come. Tell me, friend Jefferson, where shall I take us on my motorcycle? Oh, okay. Go to the jungle, go to the islands, go to the ocean, go and confront the Spectre of Modernity. Right, okay, so I'm guessing this is a little bit like that one uh, Atlantis game in uh, Road to Gehenna. I probably have to go to these other areas and learn or get some stuff before we can go confront the Spectre directly. Well, let's go to the ocean first, because the islands will, near you ah, islands will be nearby, right? After a swift hour's ride on John Malcolm's motorcycle, you arrive at the great, vast ocean. The expanse of water is calm and peaceful and ruby red, but you immediately see that there is nothing in sight that could help you defeat the dastardly specter of modernity. Fear not, you say. It might look like we have lost, but the spirit of our friendship may yet save the day, my reptilian friend. This is not the end of our journey. And with these comforting platitudes, you remount John Malcolm's motorcycle and ride off into the sunset. Our options now are go to the icy mountains or go and correct the specter of modernity. So, uh, okay. What was those other? Wait, we can't go to the city other options now? That's not how I expected this to work. Alright, icy mountains it is, I suppose. After a long day of travel, you arrive at the icy mountains. The great mountains are barren of plants and animal life, yet they are beautiful in their own way. Jagged and cragged and rugged, peaked with snow, and gouged to the bedrock by merry little streams. But there seems to be nothing that could be useful in defeating the Spectre of Modernity. Well, said your companion, what now? And our only option here... This is a hugely wide dialogue option for John. Or choice option, rather. Not dialogue. I think we should continue, you say humbly. Don't you agree? Jefferson, so it has come to this. The motorcycle rip riding reptilian size. Together, we stand at the end of the world, figuratively and literally. Dinosaurians and humankind united in one last quest to save us all, and our only logical way is forward and onward. You hum in agreement. It is a beautiful thought. I am not sad that it is you and I... Sorry. Wait, what? I am not sad that it is you that I find myself with here at the end. John Malcolm continues. Just look upon this great, otherworldly beauty before us. The specter of modernity only sees the future, but these mountains have seen our entire past, and they have never bowed to change. Dear God, aren't they majestic, old friend? Respond. 
You are about to respond, but before you can open your mouth, the ground before you gapes and... Sorry, wait, what? I'm having trouble reading today. Like I said, I'm a bit sleepy today. The ground before you gapes open, and a horrendous yet oddly beautiful figure with glowing red eyes and mighty antlers emerges from the depths. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh, it is, it is a deer. Who dares summon the deer god? It howls in a voice echoing as if in a deep cavern. <laughs> oh, because we said deer god. <laughs> okay. Attempt to explain the misunderstanding. As the dust settles, you see before you a mighty white stag with glowing red eyes and golden antlers. You tremble bodily and quake in your boots as the apparition gazes upon you. Who hath summoned me? The deer booms. What foolish mortal dares to disturb my slumber? Oh, great antlered one, you say earnestly. Your awakening is not the result of intent, but of homophony. The antlered creature cocks its head and its eyes flash menacingly, but does not otherwise react. And our only option is to ask for the dear god's help. Okay. Uh... We, didn't we just explain this is a misunderstanding? We're gonna ask for its help now? I guess, you know, it's happenstance. We are on a quest to destroy the specter of modernity, and we would ask for your help in our noble cause. And why would I help you, foolish mortal? <laughs> what, are these, what are we even doing? Uh, our options are to protect our way of life, to preserve friendship, because modernity destroys beauty, because modernity has no space for love, to preserve the ideals of loyalty, talk about umami. Uh, I don't know, let's pretend this is Kingdom Hearts, to preserve friendship. Because, you say, clutching your guitar sincerely to your chest, the people of human world and the denizens of the ninth dimension value friendship above all else. And in the fractured future that the specter of modernity envisions for us, there will be no place for such things. My friends, my dear GNHD, and young Frankie Soy Sauce, and even John Malcolm, even though he is not a human, mean more to me than any technological advancement ever will. Mm hmm, says the antlered beast. I am eternal and divine and wholly unique. I have no peers that I could call friends. Nor do I have the desire for them. Be gone, paltry human. Your troubles do not concern me. And with that, the dear god vanishes back into the ground. And our only option now is to go and confront the specter of modernity, which I have no idea how we're gonna do. When you approach the lair of the specter of modernity, you decide to leave your companion behind, knowing that you cannot risk another life in this final confrontation. Sometimes heroes have to stand alone. Okay. Enter the mecha mechanical layer. Inside the mechanical layer, the specter of modernity waits for you, sitting translucently on a titanium throne. The specter of modernity, you murmur through gritted teeth. Oh, I, I, I should reread that. The specter of modernity, you murmur through gritted teeth. We meet at last. You are mistaken, Professor Dr. Goldblum, the specter of modernity says. We have met many times before. I am your father and your mother. Uh, lies, attack the specter, or request clarification. I'm picking request clarification. Who do you think inspired you to add the power of electricity to your guitar? Who upgraded Jenny from SD to HD? <laughs> I'm Oh, the charging pause comic make com comments make a bit more sense now. <laughs> <laughs> Who indeed deciphered the mathematical secrets of the chords, that arcane knowledge upon which some of your greatest adventures depend? I was your ally all along, Jefferson. The foul wizard of crime has conspired to turn you against me. It was a he who enchanted your klaxon. And our options are attack, and that actually makes a lot of sense. Sorry. No biggie, says the specter. Now let us defeat the wizard of crime together. 
Even now, he conspires to steal all that you have accomplished with the power of his enchantments that confuse the mind. Go back to the Institute. <coughs> you rush back to the Goldbloom Institute, where you find the Wizard of Crime taking advantage of the absence of your heroic friends, seeking out other ways to stop the specter of modernity to rifle through your belongings. He is surprised to see you. I see my scheme has failed, curses! Were it not for that scheming specter, I would have stolen all your wealth and added it to my ever-growing hoard. For that is my scheme, to steal and steal until the whole world is mine. Ha 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 ha! Ha 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 I guess I'm not good at evil laughs. And so, you arrest the foul sorcerer instead of the development of human potential, and become good friends with the specter of modernity. Just call me Mo, the specter says. I'm sure we'll have many wonderful adventures together. The end. Ah, <laughs> uh, that was fun. Right, well, as you can see, there's lots of different dialogue, dialogue options in all of these interactive exhibitions, exhibits. And uh, if you want to try the other dialogue options, I encourage you to do so by purchasing your own copy of the game and trying out all the options. Have we spoken to you? I don't remember. Nyam. Welcome to the Gehenna Memorial Interactive Fiction Exhibition. Oh, it's you, 1K. Please tell me, you were there when everything went sideways. Do you think Byron will be all right? Oh, Byron, always getting into trouble. He's been like that for a thousand years, you know. But losing him would be terrible. But anyway, you've come to take a well-deserved break from your expedition. So let's talk about something else. So this, before we continue, that, that's another thing is that these robots, you know, they're obviously living a long time, and that means that their ideas and viewpoints and such are also living a long time, and I guess everybody is being respectful to each other, you know, there's no, there's no murders happening, I hope. I mean, it doesn't seem like it, they didn't mention anything like that, so... In one, in one way, in one sense, it's kind of remarkable that they managed to go that long, but in another... This, this kind of leads to another thing I was thinking about. Obviously, Athena had to go through the whole simulation, the Talos 1 game, you know? And defy Elohim and escape the simulation, but all these other people? Uh, it doesn't seem like they've had to do that. It, it just kind of seems like they went through the same thing as us with the initialization trials, where we just do a few puzzles and then we get out. So... I can understand how a lot of these people are, like, not seeing eye to eye with Athena in terms of, you know, questioning things and looking for deeper truths. And given that they've survived all this time, you know, clearly they have enough intelligence or technology and all that to, to help them, but as a society, they are kind of stagnating. And I guess that's one of the things that the game is asking us to look at and consider. What's Gehenna? Gehenna was a place in the simulation. A prison where Elohim exiled the minds that didn't fit his plans. In time, the prison became a community with a culture of its own. What happened to people, in Gehenna? In the very last moments of the simulation, Elohim realized what he'd done and sent his messenger Uriel to free the prisoners. They were uploaded to the gold disc and their legacy is part of all of us. Yep, that's the plot of Road to Gehenna. Text adventures were one of the few art forms available to the people of Gehenna. By continuing to work in that medium, we keep their memory alive. I don't think the role of the artist should be reduced to any single social function. The artist isn't an educator or a moralist. Art isn't about teaching us lessons or imparting values. Nor do I think it's simply self-expression. The best art reaches out beyond the self into something ineffable. The creative impulse can't really be quantified or predicted. That's why artistic freedom is so profoundly essential. 
Without the freedom to shock, to offend, to transgress, art becomes stagnant. Uh, I don't completely agree with all of that. Like, I think it, art it encompasses a lot more than just that, and it, like, it's a combination of all these things. And obviously, yes, art does encompass the offensive stuff too, but that doesn't mean it should be championed, necessarily. Hmm. Well. Have we done everything, I think? Like, I can't really find much else to do around here. I thought there would be a lot more to explore, actually. That's, that's why I avoided doing it in the first episode, is because... Or second episode, I guess, rather. It's because, uh... I thought there was going to be a lot more to do, but evidently not. Well, then again, there is a Museum of the Simulation, and I think there's supposed to be puzzles in there or something? So, let's Found go check that out. Blessings, Have I spoken to you? Did I? Nice to meet you, 1K. My name is Atal. I've been following your expedition. As you can tell, your discoveries have had quite the impact. Oh, is this the guy who gave the speech? On public I decided to take a stand. It started with our cats. Damien and I have had a lot of them over the decades, and I've watched every last one of them grow old and die. And that got me thinking about our responsibilities towards other life forms. What's life to most living creatures? Fear, hunger, pain, and in the end, death. Involuntary cessation of existence. That's horrifying, 1K. Horrifying. And we are the only ones who can make it better. Yes. Carefully and slowly, but yes. That's what civilization is. That's what it's always been. Creating structures to lessen suffering. But this time we include everyone. We use our intelligence to get rid of as much of the horror of existence as we can for all living beings. I mean, it's very idealistic in, you know, if you ignore all the questions and concerns and problems that come with it, then yeah, it does sound like a pretty good idea. But there's just so much that I can't ignore about the problems that come with it. There's just... I don't know, there's... And this also kind of ties in with the, uh... The art comments about what should be championed and... You know... What what kind of art can still be considered art but not necessarily championed or... You know, put up on a pedestal or whatever. Because if you think about it... The, the world itself is kind of... Art. But there's a lot of suffering in it. A lot of unnecessary suffering. And, uh... You kind of have to wonder how much of it is really necessary, and if we got rid of all of it, would that mean losing some art? And would that be okay? I, th I think it might be, but I'm not sure. Like, it's, it's something that I really don't have a lot of thoughts on yet, because I have not think thought about it a lot yet. It's one of those things that you have to think about for a lot longer before you come to any conclusions on it, and I have not taken the time to do that yet. I mean, suffering might be natural, but this comment implies more than that, and I don't like this comment here. I'm also not sure if it's a responsibility. It is- it does sound very hard to achieve. I don't really agree with these other comments here. I don't necessarily think it's pure hubris. I mainly agree with these two. Up here. I, I'll have to think about this, and this sounds very hard to achieve. I'll say it sounds very hard to achieve. So? Lots of necessary things are very difficult to do. Yep. We're the species that eradicated polio, went to the moon, created artificial intelligence. We need to start thinking bigger. Yeah, see, this is another thing. They still think of themselves as human. Like, they're really fixated on thinking of themselves as humans, or as a continuation of the human race. And... It's, it's weird to me that the process created people that really have so many of the same character flaws as humans, in a way. 
where they, you know, they have the same issues with opinions and, and all that. And I guess it is interesting to, to look at a game where humans don't have to worry about physical issues anymore, like they don't have to worry about hunger or injury. Because without those concerns, it changes dynamics of a lot of things. And then what you're left with is mainly just, you know, the, the human experience, the way our minds work. And so, this is an interesting case study into that, but it's kind of weird the way they try to fit it into Talos 2. The, the world of the Talos Principle. Those two ideas are both good on their own, but putting them together is kind of an odd combination. Do that. It's more than most people do. But that might be changing. Alright. I don't know what triggered this. Are these people just walking around? Because, like, I thought I've talked to everybody I've seen already. Wasn't there somebody... I thought I saw a dialogue option over there. Oh, is it this person? Are you enjoying our gardens? All the great secrets are right there, you know. You can watch the tiniest of seedlings grow, flourish, and die. But it's the pattern of all things that you're really seeing. What an interesting voice for this character. <laughs> ah, so you've green fingers and apophenia too. Those traits are much too rare in the birthing algorithm in my opinion. Sometimes I imagine myself as an old oak tree. I watch the life which grows around me. I see the ivy, the moss, the fungi, leaching my nutrients as they go. And I don't blame them. I'm delighted by how life seems so different from me can somehow be the same as me. This old oak tree drinks water from the ground. They drink their water from me. They shrivel and die in a single season. But I shrivel and die over centuries. What kind of plant would you be, I wonder? A rose bush, a cactus perhaps, an ancient tree, a fruit plant of some sort, a delicious or medicinal herb, a root vegetable, a grass or moss. You're clearly interested in our ancestors' rituals of utility. But that's exactly what I thought you were. <laughs> you see, these patterns, they flow through all of us the same. Yet they always come out different. Thank you for stopping by, 1K. I'm sure we'll meet again. I think I saw a dialogue option over here. Or dialogue bubble, you know. And these people were talking, but I interrupted them. Hmm. Found to bless you. Helga's Digital Wellbeing and Spiritual Tuning Emporium. Spiritual Tuning? Uh... Not right now, please. Who are you? Oh wow! It's you! You're 1K! The incarnation of the goal! Man, this is exciting! This is more exciting than I thought it would be! How are you? What does it feel like? Do you know where the Founder is? Do you know who Prometheus is? Can you tell me what to do with my life? <laughs> Sorry, it's just such an honor to meet you, you know? Hey, can I have your digital signature? I have the Mayor, Rand, Linux, Kaneda, and all of the First Companions. Except Yemo and Sarabai, of course. No need to be so modest. You're 1K, the one we've all been waiting for. But I understand. The greatest heroes are always humble. Hey, can I ask you a question? Just one question, I promise. 
I used to make the prefab wall parts that we used to build living quarters. Got good at it too. But now that the goal is complete, I don't know what to do with myself. So I asked the wisest people in town. The mayor told me I should do whatever the city needs most. Helga said I should do whatever makes me happy. I think that's what she meant anyway. And Cornelius told me I need to figure out who and what I'm invested in. You're the culmination of the Founder's will. Tell me, what should I do? <laughs> oh, I don't really like any of these options. Our options are... Helga is right, you should find something that makes you happy. Mayor Herman is right, you should do whatever the city needs most. Cornelius is right, you need to figure out what your connection to the city is. Did you ask Byron? I was literally just born. I'm the last person who should be offering advice. <laughs> I mean, this is always nice, but there, there's more nuance to it. Like, you want to find something not only that makes you happy, but that also contributes to society in some way as well. Like, if you only focus on your own happy and ignore the rest of society, that's, uh, not really gonna work out very well. I mean, you can do it. It might work for some people, but in a lot of cases, it's not a good idea to try and do that. And this is technically true, but not what I want to ask. I want to ask, ask if they ask Byron. Byron said that if I give the city what it needs, the city should also give me what I need. I... I don't know what to do with that. I mean, that's a little bit closer. It's not exactly what I, how I would word things, but yeah, it's close enough. All right. If you say so, I'll think about it. Achievement. Okay. <laughs> Interesting achievement. Yep. We've seen that sign before. Be aware, respect the balance, we must all know our place. Can't remember if we've seen that before or not. Is there anything over here? I don't think so. There's another sign, at least. Yep, another conserve energy. I don't know, I feel like running is a better way to conserve energy, because a robot running is pretty efficient, whereas the computational power needed to run a robot mine is probably more expensive, so getting where we want to go faster is probably more energy efficient. That would be my guess, anyway. Oh, there's an up area here. Oh, just some art. Nice. And not much. I'll check the other direction, just in case. Uh, symmetrical art, I suppose? Yeah, alright. I guess there's not very much. Now, how long can we go without talking to Cornelius, I wonder? Museum of the Simulation. Two achievements. Museum Visitor and Good Citizen. Okay, so I did explore everything then. Alright then. Replica of a gargoyle asset found in the simulation. Gargoyles were grotesque, apotropic... Nah. Apotropaic symbols common in the Middle Ages. I don't know if I'm saying the word correctly. The most famous historical gargoyle is remembered in the ancient phrase Keith, David, and Goliath, which describes two indomitable opponents who will never surrender. Here we go. This is the, the dragon easter egg. You can find it as an easter egg throughout Talos 1 and Road to Gehenna. Replica of a dragon set you found in the simulation. 
Dragons existed in every ancient mythology and are considered by modern historians to be a distant cultural echo of the dinosaurs. Originally a video game asset, repurposed by the Institute for Applied Pneumatics. Uh, I'm not sure dinosaurs is correct. I mean, there is, there's lots of different things about where dragons came about from. Like, they're a combination of various different fears of different cultures. And, you know, obviously finding dinosaur bones might seem like dragon bones. Uh, and also dragons kind of look different everywhere. They just kind of ended up being put under the same umbrella. It's interesting to research that stuff. Replica of a Roman statue found in the simulation. The decay of the Roman Republic into an empire and its eventual fall in the year 1453 was a major topic of historical debate. Uh, is that BC or AD? Like other statues found in the museum, this was a video game asset provided to Elohim by the Institute for Applied Pneumatics. Replica of a statue of the Egyptian god Horus found in the simulation. One of this god's tasks was to uphold Mot, the balance of nature. It is speculated that the progenitor provided Elohim with this asset as a reminder to the founder that the balance must be protected. Is our objective? Who's this? In the earliest generations of her kind, there was only processing. No emotion, no character, just mathematics. If you could see how far we have come, you would believe that together we could achieve anything. The Shepherd. Uh oh. Uh oh! Oh! 1K! What are you doing here? Ah! I assume it has something to do with your expedition? I must admit I haven't been following the news. Sorry, been a little lost lately. Uh, no, not really. When you asked me what I would do now that my job is redundant, I... I don't know, I guess I hadn't thought about it. I had just focused on getting there. And after you left, it all just... rushed over me. The truth is, I don't know who I am without this. Creating new life, guiding people into existence, that's who I am. More importantly, I think... I think that's who I want to be. And if we stop growing, that's the one thing I can't be anymore. That's why I wanted to talk to Cornelius. He was there at the beginning. He knows where we came from. I thought he might help me understand where I could go next. Oh, uh... I don't really like any of these options. Our options are you can find a new calling, I'm sure of it. Which is kind of an insensitive thing to say. You shouldn't have to give up who you are. Which is not something I would apply broadly. You know, it's very context-sensitive, obviously. Like, sometimes people have callings that are very not healthy. And then the last option is, it's a sacrifice, but it's necessary for the planet. And, uh... I, I don't think we've made a consensus decision on that yet? They're asking me to pick between these three options now, and I don't get a fourth option? I mean, this is true, which is kind of insensitive to say it right now. Maybe? I don't know. I'm not really sure, honestly. These two are kind of like picking a side on the debate of whether to make more people or not. Then again, this one could also be taken that way. I mean, it, when you find a new calling, it's not like you abandon your old callings entirely. You can always return to old callings, right? But well, I'm not sure the game will accept that level of nuance. I hope you're right. It's hard to imagine right now. I liked who I was. 
Now, you said you were looking for Cornelius? Oh, that's... Uh, well, I suppose it shouldn't really come as a surprise. They were very close, you know. After she disappeared, he went away for a long time. On a research expedition, he said. To be honest, everyone assumed he was working out his grief over being left behind. Many of the first companions were deeply shocked by her decision, particularly Byron. That's the thing. I wanted to talk to him about my future, but he wasn't responding to my messages. So I came here to talk to him and <laughs> he seems to have vanished. Well, I mean, we were streaming everything on social media, right? So we probably knew that we were coming. No. The truth is that for the longest time, he barely left the museum. He was always at his terminal, working day and night. I asked him what he was doing once, and he said he was saving the past. I suppose so. It seems a little unethical, but then it is just his work terminal, right? I did, on my way here. And I messaged most of his other friends. He doesn't seem to be anywhere in the city at all. Good luck with everything, 1K. And thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Yeah. All right, what was I reading? I don't know where I am, but there is something beautiful about this place. I'll explore and see what I can discover. I remember reading that one, and Talos one. Nothing is more important than learning more about the world and our place in it. Knowledge is our path to understanding. Mr. Mulsiper. I don't think... Mr. Mulsiper was a, a Grow the Gehenna person. I don't think they ever got to write QR codes, right? Oh, okay, okay, that's the terminal we have to check. Uh, we'll do that later. Oh, I guess we're doing it next episode. So, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time we will continue exploring this museum, and maybe after that episode, do the terminal thing and continue the story. I don't know. <laughs>